mind in the in the uh, deep sleep state, huh. um, which allows you to actually come when you come back yeah. into the living uh, into the waking state yeah. to say that I did not know anything. Yes. Uh, so that was. Is that what you are asking? Is is that your question? Yes. See, uh, we think in deep sleep that there is no consciousness at all. Now, without consciousness, that means without being aware, there could be no knowledge. If there is no knowledge, knowledge is the effect, so there must be a cause. If there is an absence of effect, that means there is an absence of cause. So, if I say, I did not know anything, is that an experience or not? Experience. Think over it. Simple example I am giving. Suppose, uh, you want to find, is such and such a person in this room? You look, and the person is not here. What would be your answer? Okay. Another example. I ask you about a person of whom you have no knowledge. Do you know such and such a person? What would be your answer? No. I do not know. Now, when you are giving the answer, I do not know, were you aware of my question or not? Yes. Were you aware that either you knew or you did not know? Were you aware? Were you aware? Either you, uh, you think over it. Do I know or do I not know? Is it not? Yeah. So both are equally experiences. Either I know or I don't know. Then there must be mind. Even to say there must be mind. Do you follow what I am talking? If this you understood, then in waking state, are you in the waking state or not? If you answer, you are. <laughs> if you have not answered, yeah. are you sleeping or not? If you answer, no. If you don't answer, sleeping. <laughs> so, you, you say later on, I had slept. Nobody else is telling that I slept for you. You are saying, I slept, isn't it? That means you are experiencing your sleep. What was the nature of that experience? Absence of experience means absence of an object. Without an object, there would be no experience. You understand? Experience means there must be something. But is there an object there to experience? or not. Yes, there is. There is. So, because we give this answer even to objects of which we don't know. Suppose I introduce a new person and say, do you know this person? What would be your answer? No. Are you experiencing this person or not? Yes. Even though you are experiencing, you have no knowledge about this person. Now, you combine these answers and say that I was sleeping, but this answer you are giving after waking up. But during, when you are having that experience, what, what would be your present state? I am experiencing a state called sleep. You are experiencing. Without the experience, there would be no memory. And if there were to be no memory, you would not be able to say, I have slept. Wonderful experience. What is the experience? I slept well and I did not know anything. I was very happy. It's a Sanskrit word. Sukham aham aswapsam na kinchit avedisham. Sukham aham aswapsam. Means I slept happily. 
Why did you sleep so happily? I did not know anything. So that is what I was talking about. A very subtle form of mind, still it is a mind and it is experiencing. And why I say it is a mind? Because we are identified all the time with the waking mind called waker, with the dreaming mind called dreamer and with the sleeping mind called sleeper. Any identity with anything other than pure consciousness is bondage. That's why after waking up from sleep, we don't become liberated. We don't become people of knowledge. We just remain exactly the same. That's why Swami Vivekananda said, what is the difference between deep sleep and samadhi? He said, if a fool goes into deep sleep and upon waking up, Still a fool. But if a fool enters into samadhi and he comes out, he becomes fully realized, so knowledgeable person. So the, my whole point is to your answer, there is a kind of mind which, which is experiencing that state of not knowing this and there is a special technical term for that, it is called avidya. I am experiencing avidya. You know how? At midnight, completely dark, can't see anything, what do you say? I see? Because you say, it is darkness. It is so darkness. How do you know it is darkness? Because I can't see anything. So are you experiencing darkness or not? Ah, but there is a trick there. The trick is, darkness is, an, is not an object that you can experience. Darkness is a state where you can't see anything. Not only that, darkness is a state where you don't, you experience, but you don't know anything about that experience. Suppose some Chinese people, are talking. Do you hear them or not? <laughs> what do you understand? Yeah, like get off my oxygen tube. <laughs> you know that joke? Yeah. You know that? Yes, many people know. Hello. Hello. How are you? Mamanava, in this good job. Me, go some chocolate. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very good. So, very nice joke, then we start our Gita class. A man had a friend in hospital, he went to visit him, talked with him, saw another old man lying by the side, full of oxygen tubes and all that. So after finishing he went there, he was trying to talk and that fellow was all covered up, he was making strange noises in Chinese language. He did not know even that, he knew that something, it is something Chinese language. But this fellow couldn't understand, kept on looking at him, smiling. After five minutes, that fellow expired. <laughs> After ten years, this fellow went to China, still he remembered those words. And he asked somebody, what does it mean? <laughs> they explained, get off my oxygen too. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called Andhakar. Andhakar means even though we experience certain things, if we do not know what they are, so far as we are concerned, it is called darkness. Like our concepts of Samadhi. We are hearing the word Samadhi. Only some people if I give a long lecture on Samadhi, they do experience <laughs> So at all states, at all states, waking, dream or deep sleep, we are in a state of ignorance. Now ignorance has got two aspects. One is knowability accept, uh, aspect, another is unknowability aspect, Pikshepa Shakti and Avarana Shakti. Maya has got two powers. 
So during waking and dreaming, this mayas, we experience both avarana shakti as well as vikshep shakti. In deep sleep, we do not experience vikshepa shakti, we only experience the avarana shakti. Since the topic came, I'll just give an illustration. I ask you, what is this object? What would be your answer? Table. It's a table. From our viewpoint, it's perfectly right answer. But from a uh, saint's point of view, it is a wrong answer. Just as if somebody sees a rope and considers it is a snake, <coughs> what do you say? He is a mistaken person, is it not? So a saint will say to us, all that we are experiencing is only adhyasa, superimposition like that. Why? So this is nothing but God for a saint. Now what does the avarana shakti, avarana means covering, power of covering. First, it covers God. Second, it projects it. This is a table, this is a man, this is a carpet, this is a chair, etc. So, this is these two powers, that means covering power and projecting power, both are experienced during waking as well as dream state. But in dreamless state, Sushupti state, only one power is experienced. What is it? I don't know it is God, but I don't see it as anything else. That is called pure ignorance. So we are witnessing, experiencing this state of ignorance. But to experience, there must be somebody. Who is that somebody? Me means what? Me means consciousness through the medium of the mind. Because consciousness doesn't experience anything in itself. So there must be somebody other than consciousness, but without the aid of consciousness, it is not possible. So it is a mixture of pure consciousness, it is a little technical, I won't go into it. Pure consciousness, reflected consciousness, plus mind, these three combined is, is called Jivatma individual soul. This individual soul is experiencing the waking state, the dream state, as well as the dreamless state. So what happens during the waking and dream states, our mind, it becomes very disturbed. Why? Because sometimes we can be happy, sometimes we can also be unhappy, depending upon the experience. But in dreamless state, it is pure bliss. Why pure bliss? Two reasons. One reason is we do not see anything. There is absence of both Sukha and Dukkha. Sukha means happiness. Dukkha means unhappiness. Both are not there. And it is a state of what I call Advaita, non-duality. Okay, there is no, nothing else excepting pure Andhakar. When we are in deep darkness, whether a tiger is sitting in front of us, watching us, or whether a lottery ticket has fallen there through which we are going to win a billion pound, uh, this, both of us, we are totally ignorant. Ignorant means I, am, I have become one with darkness. So there is a mind. If there were to be no mind, you know what happens? What is the answer? There would be no experience. To experience something, there must be somebody. Pure consciousness can never experience anything. Pure body cannot experience anything. It is only when the body and the mind and the reflection of pure consciousness lent by the enclosed pure consciousness, when these three come together, experience is possible. Okay, now we can start. <coughs> First, 
will go through the chanting om asato ma sagamaya tamaso ma jyotirgamaya mrutyor ma amrutangamaya om shanti 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 lord lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from ignorance to illumination lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 be unto you all now we will chant this few i think you have this one om prapanna parijataya totra vetraika panaye gnana mudraya krishnaya geetam rita duhe namaha ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದ ಗಾವೋ ದೋಗ್ಧ ಗೋಪಾಲನಂದ ಪಾರ್ಥೋ ವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹ ವಸುಧೇವಸುತ ದೇವ ಕಂಸ ಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ತನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಮೂಕ ಕರೋತಿ ವಾಚಾಲ ಪಂಗು ಲಂಘಯತಿ ಗಿರಿ ಯತ್ಕೃಪಾತಮಹಂ ವಂದೇ ಪರಮಂದ ಮಾಧವ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ವೈ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಟು ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಸ್ the bhagavad gita as we said starts with one question of dhritarashtra what was the question both my people and my brothers sons pandava mamaka pandava very important words they have gathered to battle on a field called dharmakshetra and kurukshetra what did they do what happened afterwards so we also discussed why did he ask this use of this particular usage of the words dharma kshetra and kurukshetra so he knew in the intuitively that his children were going to be destroyed absolutely then why did he ask because who wants to know that all my children have are going to die because human heart always hopes against hope maybe by some miracle some of them at least have been saved but in dharma there is no such chance what is dharma the law of karma so in that context we have explained the primary meaning of dharma and the secondary meaning of dharma what is the primary meaning of dharma ah dharma means whatever is the true nature of an object that is its dharma what is the secondary meaning whatever helps us maintain our true nature that is called dharma now that is very important because this dharma and the idea of evolution are very closely related now that's why i also give an example when you when we plant a seed to in which direction will it grow so two points there very important points first of all if it is an apple seed what will it become apple tree, apple tree. if it is mango seed it becomes mango tree what is the point here the na- the true nature of an apple is to become an apple and also mango a mango now what is the implication this is what some vivekananda wanted to convert the parliament of religions and through that parliament of religions to the whole world 
he used a particular word shrunvantu vishve amrutasya putra he called every one of them the children of immortal bliss by that what he was implying really many things first thing is what was christianity's teaching man is a born sinner by very birth man is born he is negating this whole concept uprooting this concept by that one word because if you are children of sin whatever you do you will only become sinners so uh, like we have a saying you know if you feed a poisonous snake with condensed milk what will it become what do you think it will grow into more poisonous uh, because that is its nature it pro- it will produce more poison so if you are going on preaching by birth everybody is a sinner then is, you will have to uh, concede that whatever you do whether it is jesus christ god himself god cannot change one's nature that is a very important point even god can help us become one's nature but god cannot change one's nature if a man is born sinner he is going to remain a born sinner and if god helps him do you know what is the consequence he becomes a better sinner best <laughs> sinner more strong sinner yeah but if he is a divine divine by nature then there is no power on earth which is going to stop the the manifestation of that person's divinity sooner or later this is the one imp- implication to counteract what christianity has been teaching to their own devotees for centuries together the second fact scientific fact because it is based on science so that's where, that's where this illustration comes if you plant any seed two questions then so what does it become and towards which direction it grows direction of light first of all an apple seed will only grow into an apple tree that is inevitable and the more we help it through proper soil and proper fertilizer proper watering protection then it becomes quicker better but of its nature the second in which direction it will grow towards the sun towards the light only that's why it is called heliotropic helios means sun so it always grows however in darkness you put you will not get a plant which will grow towards darkness so what does the sun do what does what is this help of the sun for any plant or any human being food it helps each one to grow into our particular nature to grow better so that's what swami vekananda meant you cannot stop people from manifesting their divinity that's what he implied and now people are slowly understanding that they have changed a lot of concepts which is not our subject today okay so dharma means nature our true nature primary meaning what is the secondary meaning dharma means whatever helps and actually unconsciously this idea of evolution is there what is the what does evolution mean a creature becomes better and better and better now here hindus give or vedanta gives a most meaningful beautiful name for god in sanskrit what is it we all know it sat chit ananda and all the evolution which science is talking about deals only with one aspect of these three the first aspect what is that first aspect existence so you see whether it is sunlight whether it is one creature mutating into a different creature what is its purpose 
I want to live. Is it not? So that is how at, uh, until human birth, physiologically, biologically, human body is the best instrument for maintaining that sat. Every religion has accepted thereafterwards that there is another kind of evolution. It is not a biological evolution, physical evolution, but it is an inner evolution. And even people who do not think about or accept God, they have to accept this. Do you know what is that? This is called moral evolution. And that is, first of all, it is an inner evolution. Secondly, moral evolution has a lot of implications. The first implication is, to become morally evolved, a person needs to have absolute self-control. Because it is very easy to tell a lie, to cheat, to do something wrong, to go downhill is very easy. To be truthful, to be having certain values in life, all these things require tremendous amount of self-control. So you see, even though unconsciously, everybody is, we all have to be moral. Have you found out any, what is called political statements or economical statements or scientific statements or psychological statements which say that you can lead any type of life you mean. Now, I am reminded of a most wonderful book. There was Dr. Adler. He was one of the most famous scientists, uh, psychologists in his time. And of all the psychologists, he wrote a most wonderful book. It is called, What Life Should Mean to You. What Life Should Mean to You. All the psychologists, what they say is, if you want mental health, like physical health, you must have proper diet and you must have proper exercise. Diet, control and exercise <coughs> for physical health, for mental health. So, what, I'm, what are we talking about? Second phase of evolution is called moral evolution. That is called evolution of dharma. And dharma evolution requires one important component. Do you know what is that component? It is called chit. Chit means awareness. So, what is it that distinguishes human beings from animals? Dharma. They call it various names. Viveka. Do you know what is Viveka? The ability to discriminate between what is instinctual, what is very natural, from what we would like to become. That ability to discriminate and adopt, however difficult it is, that is called dharma. That is the next evolution, which is Swami Vivekananda spoke in his conversations, you know, with the head of the zoological garden. I forget his name. Some Babu here too. So, physical, biological evolution is finished. Stop. No more. Now the evolution should be, we are human beings. What should be the next evolution? In dharma. We are not talking about God, we are talking about moral evolution. But there is a problem with this moral evolution. First question that comes is, why should I be moral? Why should I be moral? Because in this world, there is something very, very great truth found out by Vedic rishis, practically by saints of every religion. It is called Ritam. This is the greatest discovery of Vedic rishis is called Ritam. By the way, the English word Ritam is a, what is called transference of this word Ritam. That's why in our hymn, Om Hrim Ritam Tvam. What is Ritam? What is Dharma? What is Rita? So, beautiful definition of it is, so, dharma 
is what we learn from the scriptures. And rhythm is to put it into practice. practice. This is the difference. Now, what is, what is it? What is rhythm? Harmony. What is rhythm? To say rhythm. What is it? It's a balance. There is a balance in every aspect of our life. Even if it is uh, your own money, how much can you eat? What type of things should you eat? Now, a, any dietitian will tell you that there must be a balance. And that balance name, another name for that balance is, do you know? Yoga. Samatvam Yoga Vichyate. This We talk about rhythm. What is rhythm? We Every human being has got to three personalities. Our problem, huh? Three no. The body, the mind, and consciousness. Tripartite, we say it. Usually, in the Western philosophy and psychology, only two aspects are taken. Body and mind. But there is another aspect, according to Vedanta, which is totally separate. It is not part and parcel of body and mind. It is totally different. Now, if there are three personalities, what is the real personality and what we call adjective personality? Like, you know, when we say, this rose is red. What is the substance? What is the adjective? Adjective is red. red. Yeah. Sub rose is a subject. Rose is the subject. 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 Something that describes the rose. So, red is the adjective. Yeah. It is to distinguish the substance called rose from other roses. Is the consciousness equal to soul? Yes. Yes, we use that word Atman oh. or Paramatma or soul, oh. English language, pure consciousness. Oh. This is what self, this is what we use it. Oh. So whenever we say I, what does this I really mean? It is a combination of body, mind and consciousness. How do we know that these, these do not belong to the same level of reality? Or are these two separate levels of reality? So, in the beginning, the analysis goes like that. For example, what is the essence of this table? Wood. So, can the table can the table remain without wood? No. But can the wood remain without the table? Yes. Yeah. That means. The tableness is an adjective, Viseshana, and the wood is Viseshya, the substance and the qualities. Is that point clear? Yeah. Okay. If we take that example, when I say that I and body and mind are all these, which is the substance, which are the qualities? I. Okay. I body is definitely temporary, so that that doesn't define anything. In fact, the, the mind is even more temporary than body, <laughs> because no, but without without mind, the body is dead. Body is not dead. As in the for some time, is, yes, but uh, when we when you are sleeping, the body is not acting with the. Now the mind is not acting with the body, but it's not dead. The no. mind will be dead, the body will be dead when prana departs. Oh, so prana is the consciousness? No. Yeah. No. That's, that's what I'm coming to. This is a very important point. That is where morality can be distinguished. That's why I'm coming to that point. So I, mind, body. So, how to know what is a substance and what is a quality or adjective? How to know? Very easy. If the table were to speak, the wood was to speak, what, do, what would the wood say? I am wood, but this tableness, shape and name are my adjectives. They cannot live without me, but I can live without them. 
In fact, before the table came, what was remaining? Wood. Okay. Now, taking that example, apply it to eye, mind and body. Can the mind and body, uh, can the eye remain without body and mind? Yes. 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 We have to understand it very clearly. But, can the body mind <coughs> live without eye? No. 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 Therefore, this whatever is quality or adjectives totally is dependent upon substance. And the substance is totally independent from the qualities. Where is this talk leading to? The learning is the moment we say substance and qualities are different, substance is real, qualities are agantuka, we say, come and go. Today it may be table, tomorrow it may be chair, day after tomorrow firewood, anything it can be. But the woodness will always remain there. Apply this to I and body and mind. Okay, now I am bringing another argument to make this point clear. In language, we use two words, I and my. We discussed it. Do you remember? My table. The moment I say, we say our table, my table, this I and table, whatever I am speaking of, my are totally. Is that point clear? And we are very clear on this point so far as everything else is concerned. But the moment it comes to body, we are using uh, interchangeably that you know, sometimes I say, I am not well. And at other times, our next breath, we say, my head is aching. I am having pain and my head is aching. Same thing we say with regard to the mind also. Okay? So, my mind is disturbed. My mind is restless. My mind cannot concentrate. Then immediately say, I cannot concentrate. The important point for us is I and my are as different as heaven and earth, light and darkness, life and death. Do you see? Totally different. No connection at all. That's a very important point. Now what is we are talking about? All this subject has come with re, in the context of dharma. What is dharma? Dharma is I want to be truthful. And I want to be unselfish. What is dharma? What is morality? You have to understand what is the meaning of morality. You feel sympathy towards somebody who is in distress, in suffering. Is it not? Yes. But at the same time, Swami Vivekananda points out that is only half morality. The other half morality, when somebody is happy, do you feel happy? When somebody is suffering, then it is natural, uh, most of the time, we feel, or, oh, that person should not have, because we know what is suffering. So when someone is happy, why is it we are not happy? We feel jealous and all those things. That's where Maya comes. So what is morality? Swami Vivekananda, he gave a definition. Morality is to feel oneness with everything. To feel oneness with everything. That is called sympathy. Sympathy means what? To feel the same feeling like the other person. Empathy, sympathy, we use these words. So if I don't identify myself with somebody, how, how am I going to show my feelings towards that person? And this we do automatically with regard to our persons. You know, a mother is very happy if the child is happy. And when the child is suffering, who suffers more? Mother. It is the mother who suffers more. So, that feeling of identity is defined as morality. So, when a person wants to show his compassion, his kindness and his truthfulness, and why, do, why should we uh, tell truth? This is the question that comes because I don't want anybody to tell me an untruth, isn't it? That's so why you say, even a liar, 
doesn't want to others to tell him a lie. He wants to tell lies to everybody. And not only that, he cannot tell lie to other people unless he can convince others that it is not a lie, but it is the truth. So even for a lie to be effective, it must appear to be the truth. So this is where the next revolution has to come. We must identify ourselves with everything in this world. To the extent we extend our identity, to that extent we grow in what is called dharma. Okay, now there is a problem here. So, a table and a chair cannot be identical because they are two completely separate things. And a dog and a horse cannot be identical. To be identical, they must have the same nature. And if we cannot identify ourselves with our pure consciousness, if we keep on identifying with body and mind, my body mind is different, your body mind is different, everybody's body mind is completely different, so there cannot be morality. There cannot be morality. You see the point? But if I want to be moral, there must be a common element within each one of us with which we know and it is the same in me, in you and in everything else. And that identity is called dharma. So the first such identity is called sat. What is the common thing between me, table, you? I exist, table exists, you exist, a creature exists, a mosquito exists, a plant exists, water exists. Therefore, that is where there is a common ground and that is where we can practice dharma. That is why do not pollute anything. Is dharma doesn't mean only practicing certain virtues towards other human beings. It extends far beyond that to not only to living creatures, even to non-living creatures. How do we extend that? That is a concept called sacredness. Everything is sacred. Earth is sacred. Water is sacred. Fire is sacred. Air is sacred. And if we make them unsacred, non-sacred, who suffers? We say that, you know, when a man spits into the sky, where does it fall? So, that is called morality. Now, to practice morality, why is it necessary? Because the first step towards our dharma, what is our, what is our dharma? We are divine. If, if my dharma, my nature is divine, what is your dharma? Divine. That is also? Divine. Yes. You know, very simple example, Guruji. Um, I have this doubt in my mind. Huh. When I am doing gardening, hmm. I want some plants to grow and some not to. Yeah. And particularly when you are having a fruit or a vegetable patch. Yeah. You have, I have to use certain things which are very dangerous for slugs and snails. They for do, those? They do die. Yeah. So then am I polluting the, by making them, I know they are going to come and eat those yeah. pellets. Yeah. They are invariably going to die. Yeah. And I feel a bit concerned next morning when I see all the dead yeah. slugs on the ground. Yeah. I feel I should stop using it, but then... At this, I, 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 I understand what you are talking. At this stage of your development, it is your dharma to protect those plants and then let go. But a time will come when you cannot harm any creature in this world. Yeah. I will give an example. We, most of our devotees know. Nag Mahashaya. He had a, Nag Mahashaya was a householder devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. One of the greatest personalities I have ever read about. Now he had a very poor hut, what we call. And then that hut is, you know, in, in India, every house is supported by some pillars. And his, his uh, uh, wooden pillars. So one of the wooden pillars was rotten and lot of, what is it called? What? Termites. Termites. Thousands of termites were living there. 
what happened one day when nag mahashay was absent one some devotee came there he observed this he said oh nobody is there to take care of nag mahashay so he took all the termites and then threw them out he was very happy patting himself that i have done some great good nag mahashay came and he noticed immediately he said what happened the devotee went forward and said i did all this thing. he started beating his head and said what have you done for generations together they made this pillar their home today you made them homeless <laughs> so he went out and brought all of them and then he told mothers please forgive me from today i promise you nobody in future is ever going to make you homeless so long as i live <clears throat> okay another day a cobra entered into his house small house and somebody informed him there is a cobra you know what happened he went to there and said mother this is this is not a proper place for you you will be harmed please come i will take you to your home it must have wandered by mistake you know you know he was going like that and it followed him until he reached the forest and then said mother this is your proper home please do not to trouble your poor devotee son ke you see for him he could have easily killed that snake but he would never do swami turiyananda this happened you know in shanti ashram yes it happened <coughs> they built a cottage it's called meditation cottage and then one day somebody came and told you know below that some poisonous snake rattle snake or something was there then he simply said take it and then leave it somewhere else don't kill it sir ram krishna could never kill at one point he could never kill anything holy mother's life sir ram krishna asked physician asked holy mother to boil that what shrimp Huh? No, no, not for what's a snake. Cassie. What is it? Snake. 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 so every saint you will find a time will come when you cannot harm anything consciously but at this stage of your development if you don't do it then so many things you will be neglecting in fact you can't wash your face with soap <laughs> so many are there and you can't eat yogurt <laughs> What is, What is yogurt? Like bacteria. What? <laughs> yeah, you cannot do anything. So certain things we have to accept as game of the life. Okay. Okay. Let's come back to the subject. <coughs> we are talking about dharma. I said dharma. One part of dharma is morality. That is not the only part. So one part of dharma is morality. What is morality? to feel oneness with everything else to feel oneness we also said there must be some common element you cannot equate one body with the other body you can equate one sweetness with another sweetness one saltness with another saltness there must be some common element and what is the common element existence that is why we start our Uh, moral life with sat being sat sat means existence that is how then you what is the next thing chit chit means awareness and when we want to practice morality what is the first thing that is necessary awareness i have to be aware every second am i doing right thing or am i doing a wrong thing then mind control yoga what is mind control you have to do what you have to do but don't worry about the <coughs> results that is part of the dharma that's why it is called karma yoga as opposed to karma it is called karma yoga yoga 
Okay, now we are in a position to understand what we are talking about. Dhritarashtra asked the question, it is Dharmakshetra. Dharmakshetra means what is a field of Dharma. What, what is field of Dharma? It is law of Karma. If you do good, good result. If you do evil, evil results. My question to you, if you don't do anything, you don't get any result. That is wrong, absolutely wrong. It is a papa, it is a sin not to do anything. Why? That is called, they have given a technical name. It is called Pratyavaya. If you don't do your dharma, your duty, then it is a sin. So, as a human being, what is my duty? Simple. As a human being, it's my duty to be a human being. Because I can behave like a beast, like an animal. So, I may not behave like a god, but at least I should behave like a human being. And what is the characteristic of a human being? Discrimination. Huh? Discrimination. Yes. Discrimination, morality, but most important point is reasoning. That's why the nature of animals is instinct. The nature of human beings is reason. And the nature of saints is spiritual beings are intuition. Intuition. But all these three have a common sense. That common sense is that we have to behave according to a human being. That's why that's where Sri Ramakrishna's most wonderful definition, Manush, Man, Hush. It's a beautiful Bengali uh, utterance of Sri Ramakrishna. Who is a human being? He who is completely aware that he is a human being. human being. And what is it to be human being? That he must have reason. We will have occasion to think about it because it's a wonderful word. But here, Ritarashtra, he was a blind fellow. What is blindness here? We have to interpret. Knowing, not knowing. Seeing, not seeing. Hearing, not hearing. To follow what it is? Though we see it, but we turn a blind eye, we say it. He knew how much his sons have been doing right in front of his eyes. But he did not prevent them. On the contrary, there is a saying, Maunam Arthangi Karam. By not protesting, then he has already encouraged it. That is why Patanjali Yoga Sutra says, if somebody is doing something wrong, either directly doing or encouraging other people to do or not protesting when we find somebody is doing wrong, all the three people will incur sin. And Dhritarashtra was incurring actively because he was encouraging his sons. Now he is asking this question, what has happened? And the answer is very clear. He himself knew because if it is Dharma Kshetra, then the result will be law of karma. They are going to be destroyed. There is no question of somebody else destroying. Now here is a very important point. If he is using that word dharma, can he blame either Krishna or Pandavas or anybody else for the destruction of his children? No, because their son's nature can't be changed. No, no. The point is, if they are unrighteous people, their destruction is caused by, by what? Their own unrighteousness. This is great lesson for us. What, what does it mean? It means... A whatever happens in life to anybody, either you have to say it happens by the by one's own karma or it happens by the will of God. I like this point to be kept all the time because if you claim you believe in God and yet you talk there is injustice in this world, either you don't believe in God or you don't understand what is God. And you don't also understand what is called injustice. Now, how to reconcile? That is our individual effort. Okay. Dharma Kshetra means that Kshetra or field. It field means by definition, what is it called? Cultivable. If you don't cultivate, it won't yield the fruit. That's why the next word is 
What is the next words? Kurukshetra. The Sanskrit word Kuru means it is an imperative, it is a command in Sanskrit to do. That is why commandment. Kuru, you have to do. You have no option. Oh, you may do, you may not do. That will not help. You will have to do it. So this is Kurukshetra and battle had taken place and what happened? So here is importance of that one. Mamaka, my children. He was supposed to be father to both equally, his own brother's children. But he made a crystal clear distinction. These are my people and these are others' people. So what happened? He, he already knew instinctively he was not a fool. What was the answer? In this context, we have discussed in our last class, what is the primary meaning of dharma? One's own nature. What is the secondary meaning of dharma? Anything that helps us maintain our true nature. In that context, in today's class, what were we discussing until now? That we are evolving. Why is, why is the body evolving? Because this is what is going to help us to regain our lost true nature, to rediscover our true nature. It is never lost. Like a rope is never lost even when the person is seeing only the snake. snake. It's a mistake. It is called superimposition. So the body is the first instrument. What is the next instrument? Mind. That is where mind should be controlled, dharma, he says. So, what is the third, third aspect of evolution? It is called spiritual evolution. What is that spiritual evolution? To know I am that. The whole Gita teaching is to bring us to that ultimate knowledge. What is that? Thou art that tattvamasi. And the disciple, the student, the sishya has to realize it. I am that aham brahmasmi. That is the teaching. Now we will go a little bit before we go into further. This was the Rishrasa's first question, only question, first sloka. And this first chapter is called Arjuna Vishada Yoga. It has got 47 verses. How many? 47. 47. Now we will very briefly we say, what happened as soon as Arjuna went there? Uh, first, what happened? Both armies are ready. Then Duryodhana was approached Dronacharya and Bhishma was by his side and he was describing. Duryodhana approached and insinuating, you know the word insinuation, indirectly accusing that you, you all favor Pandavas. So he is addressing, look at all this arid army and who made this strategy? Your Tava Sishyena Dhimata by your disciple because Dronacharya taught this uh, all the Vyuha, everything to his disciples. See, your own disciple. You should not have taught him. And now he is there to kill you. So, yeah, don't become partial. You are fighting for on, on my side and you are eating my food, don't become ungrateful. This was addressed to both Duryodhana as well as Dronacharya and Bhishmacharya, both. This is what he addressed. Then they heard and then they wanted to uh, show their enthusiasm. What in those days, you know, like nowadays, uh, in this country banners will be there, special arms, coat of arms they call it. Everybody has got one one. So, Bhishmacharya first started the beginning saying, we are ready to begin the battle. So, as soon as Bhishmacharya did, all others have done. But in the Bhagavad Gita, the description is given, each one of the great souls have their own special kongs, Ananta Vijayam Raja Kunti Putro, like that, Poundram Dadmau Mahashankam Bhima Karma Vrikodaraha, etc., etc., it will go on. So, conks blowing. What is this conks blowing? Boosting their courage and also indicating the battle is about to begin. So, from verse 2nd to 11, 
Duryodhana's address to both uh, Dronacharya and Bhishmacharya. From 12th to 19th, Kongs blowing. Huge description, you know. Then at the end, uh, he, he, one verse is there. Saghosho dhartrashtranam hridayani vyadarayat. So, the Kongs blown by the Pandava army, it just shattered the confidence of the opposite party, as though it happens. Why it happens? Because sometimes intuitively we know who is going to win. Why? Because where there is dharma, there is a self-confidence. Where there is no dharma, there is no self-confidence. Simple example, a student had studied very hard and written examination very nicely. He will have self-confidence. The other fellow spent all his time watching movies and then doubtful. Then he went and wrote something. He is not very confident at all. So what we do, if we do things rightly, there is a kind of feeling that it should come out okay. That feeling, the Kauravas didn't have. But the Pandavas had and it is shown through the noise that they made. This was from 12th to 19th. Verses 20 to 23, Arjuna requests Krishna to place his chariot in the middle so that he can survey both the armies and appropriately he can arrange it. Now, it's something called Vyuha. Even today it is followed, armies. The arrangement of the armies, how to fight. So, there is different names like Garuda Vyuha, Padma Vyuha. Vyuha means the way an army is arranged. You know, Abhimanyu, he died. Padma Vyuha. He said, I knew only how to enter, but I don't know how to come out. These people said, no, no, don't worry, we will be following you. But they could not do it because of Jayantrathas, uh, what is called, uh, he got a bone from God. That nobody, on that day, nobody can defeat him. That's why uh, nobody could help. But the point we have to understand is, was not Sri Krishna there? Did he not know? Yes. He knew it. And yet he allowed because that later on he told, Mayai Vaite Nihataha Purvameva. All these people have been dead, killed by me long before. Now, important word is, don't, do not misread that meaning and say only Kauravas I have killed and Pandavas I did not kill. You should never say that. How many people remained at the end of the Kurukshetra war? Even Pandavas only children and Draupadi's five children also died. 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 He knew it. The Lord knew it. But he didn't tell about it. Simply Arjuna misunderstood. Oh, Krishna had killed everybody. So all the time only, you know, I am shooting dead bodies. No. <laughs> he was shooting at so many of his own people. In war, that's what happens. So this was the description. Arjuna wanted to see. Sena yor ubhayor mathye ratham sthapaya me achyuta. O Lord, uh, you keep my uh, chariot in between these two armies so that I will be able to observe both of them and devise an appropriate response to Kauravas. Because they are also there. Dronacharya himself taught him. And do you think that he will not do that? He will do all those things. So, Sri Krishna, what did he do? He drove the chariot in front of Bhishma, Drona, Duryodhana and everybody. <coughs> now, something miraculous happened. Until that point, Arjuna was 150% confident, I am going to annihilate. The moment he went, then in his mind, this delusion had entered. What is the delusion? Bhishma is my Pitamaha. Dronacharya is my teacher. And so many people, Duryodhana and his hundred brothers and all those many, Shekuni, Karna, Karna was not there. Later on he comes. All these people, he had no qualms. He would have squashed them. But there are so many people because of whatever reasons, they had joined Kauravas Matri and they all loved each other. That's why he says, Pitaraha, 
మామక శాల సంబంధిన మై రిలేటివ్స్ మై అంకుల్స్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఇంక్లూడ్ ఆన్స్ ఆల్ దోస్ పీపుల్ ఐ సీ హౌ కెన్ ఐ కిల్ దెమ్ బికాస్ దే వర్ ది పీపుల్ బికాస్ ఆఫ్ హోమ్ టుడే ఐ ఆమ్ వాట్ ఐ ఆమ్ హౌ కెన్ ఐ pitilessly heartlessly annihilate them this is what he was telling so this was the description beholds bhishma drona etc then his heart sank in this connection i remember you know it is if you kill a lot of people somehow it will have a terrible effect upon the heart of the person it is said the person who uh, discharged the bomb over hiroshima you know what happened to him he committed so he said later he could not stand it so then arjuna started lamenting lamenting what is the point why are we doing all these things after all for what sake for a little bit of kingdom but they have had to tried all those things you give me a little land he said even that much land which can stand on the end of a needle also i am not going to give and he was determined but here moha comes what is the point here the point is even though we know what is right hmm. somehow this delusion there is a special power which overpowers us and it it doesn't allow us to do what's our duty to do now arjuna was a kshatriya the question of these are my uh, parents these are my relatives me these are my grandfathers this equation should never come into that field duty is duty so one of our swamis gives an example suppose you are a judge and a report has come somebody had committed a heinous crime heinous crime and the moment you 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 come to know you want to give him appropriate punishment then he is brought and you are stunned why because he is your brother in law <laughs> what will you do you see if you punish your brother in law who is going to suffer your sister your own sister what will you do that is why a physician should not treat uh, other himself and or his family members and a judge also should never judge anybody who is even remotely related to him because this my iness and minus this will come when minus comes it will be minus minus <laughs> not only that the moment any fellow says mine it becomes a mine <laughs> yeah it this is the problem so arjuna was overcome with that then uh, we will come back to the a little bit more detail verses 38 to 44 evils resulting from wars kulakshaya means destruction of family families with the destruction of family family traditions family values they go down so what happens erosion of cultural and spiritual values and the result is profound unhappiness now here is a beautiful word we will explore it further dharma is equivalent to happiness adharma is equivalent to unhappiness no second question about it so how does it happen i will just give you a little bit brief what does dharma produce dharma means righteous action what does righteous action produce happiness not directly it produces something we call punya virtue we call it and unrighteousness what does it produce sin vice sin so virtue and vice sin and merit merit and sin punya and papa now what does punya do what does papa do this is a very wonderful concept what does punya do punya means it leads to happiness punya means happiness papa means unhappiness happiness there is no question of indirectness why why did i raise raise this topic because the moment you say punya it means the person will have a good house he will have good family 
everything will be very favorable that is also correct papa means what just the opposite but that cannot give us correct idea what does punya do it produces a favorable environment in the mind which is capable of squeezing the highest happiness possible for that mind what does the papa do that is a state of mind which produces only deep unhappiness are you with me so punya doesn't always necessarily external things it is a state of mind now where what is, what is happiness is it something external or is it a state of mind and what is unhappiness that is also a state of mind only so punya may or may not give any external things i will tell you why and papa may or may not bring any external things but the, it produces it shapes the mind so that whatever be the circumstances a, a mind with punya it always experiences only happiness and a mind with papa it experiences only intense suffering according to the density of the punya or papa okay here is an example suppose here is a rich man and he is sitting and he has got first class food is an air conditioned room and he is sat down but something is worrying him here is a poor man just we call it you know ragi mudde just uh, you know uh, some ordinary chapati or something you know chatu chatu and he is ravenously hungry and he is there in a, in the outside where it is 45 degrees in calcutta and all that you have, have you noticed whose happiness is great the poor man the chatu wala yeah it is true why because that man's punya is greater at that moment but i am not saying the rich man also can be very hungry he will also get but i am trying to illustrate the state of the mind punya is a state of mind where he can derive the maximum happiness even from the least of things and papa is a person he he, he uh, extracts the intense suffering even the from the best of things that's a very important point you have to and how does it apply in our day to day life now look here is bill gates you know bill gates home is considered future home yeah as soon as he enters the doors will open and the smart home smart like smartphone when a person has a smartphone who is smart yeah so what happens as soon as he enters the home knows what type of temperature he likes what color she likes what type of coffee he likes what type of program she likes everything it learns and it makes it so here is a rich man here is sriram krishna holy mother what what did holy sriram krishna have for example small room and not even attached bathroom now whose happiness is greater sriram krishna's happiness just see any yogi any spiritual person that's what happens because happiness is a state of the mind this is a very important point so many important point this is a very important point happiness has nothing to do first of all with anything external even if mosquitoes are biting swami vivekananda could forget his body and be in, absorbed in deep meditation is he getting happiness or not yeah. so that is the important point we have to say everything depends upon the mind but how does the mind become very important what should be done with that mind we are all given that mind so we have to train the mind how to how it can derive the highest type of happiness how to avoid any type of 
suffering minimum mind you minimum amount of suffering is inevitable but uh, that is minimum to equal to everybody after that it depends upon each individual now how to train the mind that is called morality gives us strength more happiness ultimately and spirituality gives the highest type of bliss happiness this training is called evolution what is evolution first we train the body to be in this condition then we train the mind to be first perfection in morality next perfection in i would say upasana or contemplation next it is knowledge perfection in knowledge okay i will bring in that idea of division of happiness we did so many times we always divided happiness into bliss into how many 5 7 5 5 categories vishayananda medhananda kalananda dharmananda or bhajananda and brahmananda so what is the point here the point is vishayananda depends upon even though certain things but even then it need not be totally dependent upon external thing it depends upon certain training in the mind mind only but certain ex- it it becomes it in the the vishayas uh, seem to be uh, helping it to gain that happiness what is medhananda intellectual happiness the higher the happiness the less it is dependent upon anything anything so medhananda means intellectual medha intellectual happiness that is why a very twice born is goes on praying dhiyo yonaha prachodaya give me that medha medha means the capacity to enjoy intuitive truths but we can also take a student also prays an artist also prays and a moral person also prays ultimately a spiritual person also prays for that same buddhi this buddhi and in at these five levels first is dependent upon the external world next is dependent upon the intellect third is again depending upon a higher faculty called art aesthetic joy and fourth it is the joy that comes from practicing morality and lastly it is becoming one with god god himself now here also is a beautiful thing is a wonderful ideas are flowing you know when we are experiencing any external object when can we derive 100% that is possible through the medium of that object we our mind must become totally one with that object okay how can an intellectual person derive happiness intellectual happiness when his intellect becomes totally one with the object of anything intellectual it could be science it could be you know poetry it could be anything then it, but it must become one with that through focus when an artist artistic mind aesthetic sense becomes one with the object of his like it could be music it could be poetry uh, it could be uh, playing an instrument it could be sculpture it could be painting any of these dancing singing all these objects when the more the person becomes one with that the more happiness he derives not only that the more he could also raise other people's consciousness to that level have you noticed it i okay the corollary of it is if i ask any one of you to sing your croaky voice will come <laughs> but you are doing such a beautiful voice in bathroom you know beautiful voice you know why two factors one factor is this you are totally relaxed second you know that there is no audience you are not conscious of anybody 
So it doesn't matter. That means you can be absorbed in yourself. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Same thing applies to. Then we discussed morality. What is the above Medhananda? What is the Ananda? Kalananda. What is above Kalananda? Dharmananda. I would say Dharmananda. Dharma means yeah, that's what we are talking about. Dharmananda and Bhajananda. Same. Same. Dharmananda and Bhajananda. So Dharmananda means the person becomes one with truthfulness. There is no conflict. Shall I tell? Shall I not tell? No. Is if I don't practice this, I will be suffering. For example, Sridharam was new, he would lose everything. But he was he would have got if he had told a lie, would he be happy or would he be unhappy? unhappy. If he had told a lie, he would have retained all his property, but he would have been profoundly unhappy. But if he had told the truth and refused it to tell the untruth, he might have lost external things, but his happiness, he, he became nearer to God. In fact, after that only God came and told him, I am going to be born as your son. Now, was he getting happiness or not? This is one of the most crucial questions because there is, we, intellectually we say that observing truthfulness is wonderful, but in practical life there are so many difficulties. This is our problem. No, no, Swami, you don't know what you are talking. You are in the monastery, but we are, you know, our boss will kick us out. But the truth is totally different. Nobody can kick us out. If we have done punya, even boss, we, we might become the boss of boss also. We don't know. But if we deserve to be kicked, whether you tell a lie or not, you yeah. will be out. That is called the law of karma, karma or dharma. Yeah. So, to become one with morality. What was our definition of what is morality? Swami Vivekananda's definition, to feel one's oneness and there is only one faculty within us which is common. What is that? Love. Consciousness. Consciousness. These, all these love and other things, secondary effects. The truth is we become one. Something is in you, something is in me and that has nothing to do with anything else. That is one. So to feel that oneness, that is called morality. Okay. So when a person is loves you say loves to be truthful loves to be unselfish loves to help other people loves everything whom do, whom is he really loving god, god. himself god. in this context himself god pure consciousness so to that extent that happiness becomes the highest and the last level what is the last level that means what is brahmananda who gets brahmananda who feels true nature. He who feels his oneness with, with Brahma. That is why Taitri Upanishad categorically says Brahma with Apnoti Param. Brahma with Brahmaiva Bhavati. So, in all these levels, what is common thing? Becoming one with the object. So, that is what Zen Buddhism says when you eat, you just eat. When you sleep, you just sleep. When you listen, you just listen. When you read, you just read. That means whatever you are doing, pay your whole attention to that particular thing, that oneness. Now, why did we discuss all these things? Because that is the implication. If there is happiness, it is also coming from within ourselves. If there is unhappiness, it is also coming from and happiness. Now you understand what is called dharma. What is dharma? To be oneself. What is a dharma? Not to be oneself. This is the real fight. The Kaurava, Pandava, all these are just illustrations. This Kurukshetra war is going on in our each human soul every second of the time. Shall I get up? or meditate or shall I sleep a little longer. <laughs> this food is very tasty. Shall I eat a little more or shall I stop? My stomach is telling stop. My tongue is telling. Have a go. There is nobody here. Have a go. So 
like this every second this fight it is called kurukshetra but it is taking place where in a field called dharmakshetra so much is implied there now what happened arjuna was taken and he has got dharma sankata what is dharma sankata all his ideas of what is righteousness what is dharma what is duty have been totally washed away by what by that delusion what is that delusion these are my my people but suppose there was no bhishma drona and other people only duryodhana and his hundred brothers what would arjuna have done simply would have been rearing why are you waiting krishna are you gita upadesha later on come on let us first finish he would have said that that is what is called moha moha delusion has come so this is nothing to do with any war it is to do with each one of the coming the between the real self and the non self this is the what is called uh, allegorical meaning of bhagavad gita so we will explore it in our next class om vasudeva sutam devam कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु